अंदर की नमस्कार आलू एंड वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू आई फील इट अ वेरी स्पेशल प्रिविलेज टू बी हियर टू पार्टिसिपेट इन दिस वाइस चांसलर्स कॉन्फ्रेंस व्हिच इज आल्सो बीइंग ऑर्गेनाइज्ड एज अ पार्ट ऑफ द सेंटेनरी ईयर सेलिब्रेशंस ऑफ द वन ऑफ द बेस्ट यूनिवर्सिटीज इन द कंट्री नॉट ओनली इन द स्टेट बट आल्सो इन द कंट्री एंड आई रियली फील इट अ वेरी स्पेशल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन फॉर मी और टू पार्टिसिपेट इन दिस एंड आई थैंक द वाइस चांसलर एंड द ऑर्गेनाइजर्स ऑफ दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी Uh, well, financing of higher education is a narrow subject, but a very important subject. Uh, higher education is becoming important, and is being realized that it is important, increasingly important, by the society as a whole, by the students, by the families, by the governments. That everybody is uh, compared to 20, 30, 40 years ago when people were not really aware of the contribution of education, higher education specifically. Today, I think, there is a, but it is important to note that higher education matters and matters for economic growth, which is becoming one of the important objectives of all the governments, including the national, the national government and also the state governments. It is recognized that an important, critical investment for economic growth and development. Um, apart from many other, for many other aspects, social, political, and other aspects, even if you are having a very narrow perspective of development in terms of economic growth, higher education is very, very critical. And it is higher education that leads to technological revolutions, it's higher education that contributes to innovations, and it's higher education that makes a difference between the advanced societies and the developing societies, and the rich countries and the poor countries, rich households and poor households. But it's also important to note that higher education contributes not only to economic growth, it also produces a huge set of social benefits, what is known in economics as the externalities. That the whole society benefits from the education of some, even if a small section of students. And these benefits are religion. They spread over different kinds of activities, uh, social, economic, political, cultural, psychological, and whatnot. And those benefits also flow very, very, for a very long period, even across generations. And that makes it really compulsory for the government, rather compelling for the government, to take serious interest in funding higher education. The third important, in fact, there are several reasons, but I can say that it is the third important reason uh, that the society, many of those, many of those other instruments, policy strategies, the higher education is considered as a, a very, very powerful, effective, and sustainable instrument for promoting equity in the society and any welfare state which has equity as an important consideration has to necessarily spend on education. One simple finding that we can find uh, from large amount of international evidence is the countries which are having strong public higher education systems with heavy funding from the state are those countries which are at the forefront of the development. They are economically advanced, they are socially better, better placed and politically stable and matured. Compared to the societies which where the higher education systems have been weak, and more particularly the public higher education systems have been weak, and those countries are economically less advanced, or they are still categorized as developing countries, and uh, they are politically and socially backward. And political instability and violence has been an important feature of many other societies. <laughs> so from variety points of view, it's important to note that Investment in, investment in higher education is a critical investment for the development of the society, and we have no choices. And I say, underline this point that we have recognized that there is no choice because if we understand that particular imperative, then we'll find out the methods of finding higher education without much serious problems. We should also recognize, in fact, there are some policy makers who feel that perhaps we don't have to really spend a lot of money, but we can still help, you know, still develop higher education. We must recognize that higher education costs, and costs heavily, and you have to spend a lot of money. And if you are talking about quality of higher education, it costs much higher. And you have to really spend higher education, and spend much on higher education. And if there is a talk saying that we have to really improve the quality and standards in higher education, and that has been the statement for quite some time, but if you don't spend on education, then that becomes a talk <coughs> without any much basis or without much sense. So higher education costs and quality higher education costs heavily and the society must be prepared to spend on education in a big way, essentially because 
the large of returns to the society rapes from higher education are immense and uh, they are the foundation for the whole society's development. Now one of the quick trends that we find is when higher education system was expanding in many societies uh, um, during the post-World War period, that is 1940s, 50s, 60s, even in India, <laughs> it was quite restricted and it's only the elite groups were going to the colleges and universities. At that time, we didn't ask many questions about the importance of public funding. We assumed that public funding is important if we want to expand higher education and state was funding. I don't say state was never funding liberally, but state was funding higher education without asking a question. Today, we are talking about large-scale expansion of higher education, massification of higher education, and we have targets of increasing the enrollment ratio uh, to 30% or even beyond 30% in the near future. A phase of phase, phase partly described in the education literature as massification. And when we are talking about massification of higher education, then we are saying the public doesn't have the public checks, checker doesn't have the money, and we have to rely upon the private finance for education. That's really a big paradigm. If you want equity, if you want welfare of the society, and if you want to develop strong higher education systems with large number of students coming into the system, you need really more money. But the government is saying how the society is free, the private individuals can pay for it. And the government does not have to really do it. Particularly during the phase of massification, a large sections of the society who are first generation learners were coming into the system. Economically and socially backward sections of the society are coming into the system. And to talk about measures to raise private finances for education or even uh, explicitly or implicitly stating that public, the government, ex government funding can be reduced is a really serious, serious and costly proposal. We should recognize very well clearly that uh, most of the higher education systems were developed in the West with the heavy public funding. Still, there are some societies in the world where uh, higher education is completely publicly funded, and some of the Scandinavian countries in Western Europe are the best examples that we have. Even in the countries, even in the so-called market economies like the United, like United States, the state funding for higher education is very, very high. It's only a very small section of the students and small proportion of the universities are the private sector. While in the most of the advanced countries, it is the state which is still a predominant player for funding higher education. In the developing countries, and in India in particular, we are talking about diversification of private funds for higher education, particularly reducing the burden on the part of the state and transferring the burden to the students and the families. I think that's one one has to really understand. It. The state financing, as I said, has, state, has traditionally been the most important method of financing of higher education, and the exceptions are very, very few. In fact, I can only refer to a couple of examples like Japan and Korea where the households spend a lot of money. But otherwise, everywhere in the developed societies, it is the state which is funding higher education to a very great extent. Now, with this, uh, something like preamble, I'll refer to five or six options with respect to funding of higher education, particularly at the macro level. Uh, five or six models that are prevalent, and this, they are not necessarily alternative models, but we have to really see what is the best combination of these models that we can think of? One, as I stated, the higher education systems are heavily publicly funded or predominantly publicly funded. This is one best model that is still prevalent in some of the societies. And higher education systems are qualitatively rich there and quantitatively strong and vibrant. That we are familiar with. And uh, we don't have to really borrow from the West. And we, even if we go back to 30, 40 years, Behind. I mean, we're back into our own history, we say that higher education is completely or nearly completely publicly funded. The second kind of an option that's being viewed as an option is let the private finances be raised for public institutions. So private financing of public institutions is the second model that is being talked about. It's also being talked about uh, for quite some time, but I think that the talk has become quite strong and significant nowadays. And with respect to raising private finances, there are two important sources. Uh, one important source, and I'll refer to the second one also, which is being increasingly emphasized, that is about the student fee contributions. And the argument is you raise the student fees. Rather, the premise, uh, or I would say even misunderstanding on the part of the state and the policy makers provide sometimes is that 
the students in India do not pay any fees in higher education. They are nearly getting free higher education, which is not true. There are quite a few calculations which are shown that students in higher education pay reasonably well. 15, 20, or even more than 20 percent of the cost of higher education. When it was understood that students, when it was felt that students do not pay for higher education, it was recommended, I think one of the famous committees that you know, Justice Bonaya committee quite some time back in the early 1990s have suggested that students should be required to raise to pay something like 20 percent of the cost of university systems. Even though that recommendation was for central universities, many universities, many state governments have taken it as a good data and tried to follow. Not only try to follow, in fact, it's quite surprisingly, at least surprising when I was analyzing the data, quite a few universities excel in this target quite significantly. Some universities generate 30, 40 percent, and there are a, a small number of universities which generate 60, 70, 80 percent. All public universities, publicly funded universities, or so-called government universities. A uh, heavy proportion of the costs of higher education are being raised from student fees. And we adopted different kinds of mechanisms. Introduce, uh, increase, introduce and increase the student tuition fees. Also increase examination fee, increase application fee, and increase all, all kinds of fees. In fact, many of these items were used to be provided free, but today we charge for almost every item. We look at, we began looking at every item as a cost center and a revenue generating place. <coughs> And we have introduced self-financing courses. We are also talk, we are also relying upon open distance education programs in the state universities as one of the important mechanisms of raising money. And uh, also nowadays we talk about international students as an important source of getting money, but uh, all through the student fee mechanisms. Now, one simple example that I can say is that in very, very few, except in a couple of countries, there are not many developed countries or advanced countries, educationally advanced or higher education system whether advanced or economically advanced, where the fee proportions are so high as in some other countries. I mean, perhaps you find that something like 15, 20 percent is the world uh, average, you know, and certainly not much going beyond 20 percent uh, the proportion, uh, as a proportion of the total cost of university systems. And if you go beyond 20 percent, obviously there are serious costs. And particularly if you are talking about the inclusive higher education systems and promoting the interests of the social and economically weaker sections, that would be at stake. Uh, the other measure along in the, in the, in the, under the broad heading of private financing of public higher education that we have been talk, not only talking about, but we are also for practicing is the student loan programs. <laughs> we have restructured our educational loan programs in a very big way. And uh, it is being hoped that the student loan programs become so effective and so strong that uh, with the student loan programs we'll be able to generate money, uh, generate uh, the, yeah, the, with, the, with the repayments we should be able, we should be in a position to big, build a big fund on its own which can be sufficient for funding higher education without necessarily depending upon the state or other things. And I feel that that's a very strong untenable assumption because that's not the experience of any other countries. But that's a stated goal of, uh, stated, the goal that was stated when the educational loan program was restructured in the early 1990s in the country. And we are going in a big way. And introducing little bit, little bit improvement, improvement in, the, in the educational loan programs. The essential point with respect to the educational loan programs, they, have, they are operated by the commercial banks as everybody knows and the access to the loan programs is not so easy, you know, despite several provisions that are being made. But we also find that increasingly it's becoming popular in terms of number of students. We have 34 million students, so any, any number is a big number for us. So it's, it's rapidly growing, but still it is unreasonable uh, to expect that a substantial proportion of the students in higher education would be able to take loans and make self-financing of higher education. Um, but that's another important measure. The, the fees in the student loans are being taken as two important measures of raising private finances. Apart from raising resources to other not so dangerous or not so critical methods, generate resources from philanthropy, generate resources for setting up of chairs in the universities, or research projects from private and other, other, other public and non-public sources, etc. Et the third important model that is also prevalent in quite a few systems is, uh, which we have in different terminologies, 
completely private system of education, which is completely privately financed. So private financing of private higher education institutions or the kind of self-financing institutions that we have. <coughs> that we have is something to be understood in a different way in the sense that we, in fact, some of the scholars really say that there's nothing like a completely self-financing self, -private, self -financing private university or private institution in the country because they're also directly or indirectly financed by the state. <coughs> and I'll refer to a couple of examples. But one, yes, the, the side of the private, the private institutions themselves become an important part of funding higher education because they depend upon essentially the student fees. In fact, even these private institutions, they make do they do make some capital investments in the beginning, but uh, as the practice shows, it's clear that the whole money is recovered from the students over the long time period. Now there are other models that are being talked about now, and not not necessarily now. In fact, they're also in work for quite some time. The public financing of private institutions, and we have this phenomenon under the very simple, very very clear terminology of aided colleges. We have these aided colleges uh, for a very long period and was also considered to be one of the best measures of promoting uh, some kind of a partnership even though we never thought or we never described this relationship as a private public private partnership. But public financing of private institutions has been one of the important methods of financing higher education for a very long period. And these aided colleges came up in different, in the, for the different objectives. But uh, anyhow, today uh, perhaps there is no state where state finance, where state uh, voluntarily is ready to finance uh, such colleges. In fact, there is a virtual halt in the growth of aided colleges in almost all states in the country. Uh, and states have also come up with a very clear statement that no more aided colleges would be set, would be set up or would be allowed to be set up. <laughs> uh, there are certain merits and there are certain problems with both private institutions, private aided colleges being publicly funded. But we also find a different kind of a mechanism of public financing of private institutions nowadays, uh, particularly in this particular state, but it's not exclusive to the state, where there's a free reimbursement of the students, uh, apart from grants from the state, directly or indirectly. When I say directly or indirectly, it's indirectly in, the, in terms of concessional land and concessional prices, tax incentives, etc. But also directly in terms of uh, project funding, project funding and not funding etc. So we have these five or six models, particularly the last couple of models are being now nowadays being talked about in a different terminology of public-private partnerships. Now in all these cases, it is very important to recognize and to important to remember and recognize what are the main objectives of the higher education policy that we have and uh, how far these different models uh, help us in realizing those objectives. If you want to have a positive growth of higher education system, if you want to have a quality higher education system, and also if you want to have an inclusive higher education system, how far these measures would promote those objectives. Certainly, we find that some of the measures that we have may, may be counterproductive in terms of promoting the education system. I just stated, I think, in one particular case with respect to the fees, but also with respect to the private institutions. We have a large number of private institutions in the state, in the country. Uh, to such an extent that perhaps 60 to 70 percent of the students in general higher education and 80 to 90 percent of students in our professional higher education go to the private institutions, private self-financing institutions. And these proportions are not comparable to anywhere in the world. These are the highest proportions, and I describe them as alarming proportions for the development of higher education. A strong, sustainable higher education system cannot be developed with such a strong, with a, such a heavy component of predominantly private higher education system. I think that one has to be recognized and, and noted. While there is a lot of scope for generating uh, private contributions to the public institutions, particularly through philanthropic contributions, which are also not new to the system, we have had quite a few philanthropists who invested heavily in higher education in the country, but today that's becoming a less drying up. And perhaps we have to think of different kinds of object, different kinds of mechanisms of generating philanthropic contributions for higher education system. Now, um, I end up with one, perhaps one point, then perhaps two points. One is, uh, yeah, we find that the costs of higher education are quite high. Costs of university systems are quite high nowadays. Uh, 
there are some calibrations which show that essentially in the central universities and some other institutions like IITs, the per student expenditure by the state itself comes to something like three to four lakhs of rupees per annum. Uh, and uh, perhaps in some other institutions it could be higher. Even a couple of state universities that we could quickly examine the cost of the government spending on higher education per student is quite high. Something like two to three lakhs of rupees. And it's quite important that this is partly, and then we say that the costs are very high and the government cannot pay the total cost of higher education and we have to have different kinds of mechanisms of raising resources. And some questionable and some not so questionable. But I find that the problem lies with the very understanding of the development of particular university systems. I don't speak about the colleges, but that's also applicable to the colleges. What we have done is that we have set up a very large number of small universities across the country. Uh, in this sense, <coughs> That's what one of the recommendations of the National Marriage Commission said that we need something like 1,500 universities in the country. We don't know where this come, how this uh, idea came up, but it is increasingly or largely realized that we need more and more uh, higher level of expansion of higher education institutions. Uh, but we started setting up of universities of uh, small in size and also of specific features and one or two specifically I quickly refer to it because they have a lot of implications for financing of higher education. And some of the universities have 100, 100 to 200, 300 students, while there are universities of course with 20, 10,000, 10, 12,000 students living in the same campus. Now these small universities cost heavily, but first in terms of money because the economies of scale do not exist and you have the whole university structure even for a small university. And uh, ideally, the university Single faculty universities have not only small in size, but also have different kinds of problems or, or different kinds of losses that we incur. Uh, because if there is a university with multi faculty, then the faculty from different disciplines come together, to talk to each other, interactions take place, and cross pollination of ideas take place, and new kinds of innovations and ideas come up. The research environment will be completely different from the kind of a single faculty. Great 
the third important point of the also close to this is, I think it's not completely new, as the HPAL committee has referred to these couple of important aspects. If we have to see that our universities are not on, in fact, many of our universities are becoming just teaching universities. And uh, research environment is much less, research funding is much less, research facilities are much less, but we should understand that research and teaching are the integral parts of the good university system. <laughs> and we should necessarily focus, plan in such a way that every university has a sizable component of research and a sizable component of good quality teaching. And when we say teaching, teaching not only at the postgraduate levels, again, most of our universities are having only postgraduate students, a lot of there are very, very few universities which have undergraduate colleges. And the Ishpal Committee has recommended very clearly saying that we should have undergraduate, postgraduate, and research students in the same campus. And that will have a lot of advantages. Now, they have, in fact, such kind of a completely different thinking of a different kind of a university model uh, will help a lot. It will help a lot in terms of, as I said, intellectual, building a strong intellectual environment but also has a lot of implications of reducing the student expenditures. Reducing the cost of university education itself cannot be the objective. And if that's the sole objective, then the problems will come up in a different way. But uh, better planning our university system for better academic development is important, which will also have implications for the financing of the university system. Well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm very grateful to the chair and all of you for giving me this opportunity.